Christian Robbins, and I am so happy right now to welcome you. In just a couple moments, we're going to begin today's Whole Life Action Hour. Today, we are going to be joined by our special guest, Dr. Dean Ornish, one of the true legends of our times. Uh, we're going to focus on the four proven pillars for preventing and reversing heart disease. I'm joining you right now from Boston, where I'm on my book launch tour. 31 Day Food Revolution is coming out on Tuesday, and I'm in the midst of a week that includes 31 interviews. Uh, it's a bit exhausting at points, but I have to tell you, I am so glad to have healthy food to fuel me in this journey, and I'm so glad to be doing something that matters and to be sharing a message that is bringing hope and health and healing to millions. And right now, we are about to start an action hour. We hold an action hour every month, typically on the first Saturday of the month. Whole Life Club members get premium access to these events, including the chance to submit questions in advance. Uh, and also transcripts and follow-up action checklists. Everybody is welcome to join in the events completely for free, which is why you're all here right now, whether you're a member or not. At the end of this action hour, we'll tell you more about Whole Life Club and what membership is and how it works. So make sure to stay to the end to find out also about a special, uh, huge discount opportunity this weekend only in celebration of the launch of 31 Day Food Revolution. So it looks like we are ready to start. I want to say right now that nothing about this event will constitute or in any way replaces the need for medical advice. We're offering education and our own best insights. But please use common sense. And remember, you should always consult a proper healthcare professional for any advice about treatment or response to any specific medical conditions or situations. Okay, here we go. Welcome to this whole life action hour as we explore how you can take action to heal your body and your planet with food. I'm Ocean Robbins. I'm co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network. Our focus today is the four proven pillars of preventing and reversing heart disease. And we're gonna broaden it because it turns out your heart's connected to everything else in your body. And as you're, as you're gonna hear from Dr. Dean Ornish today, the same choices that are good for your heart are good for everything else too. So let me introduce my dear friend, Dean, now. Hi, Dean Ornish, MD. Hi, Dean. I see you there. Wonderful. We're so thrilled you're here. Dean Ornish, MD, is an expert in heart health, in using lifestyle strategies to heal, and in increasing energy and pleasure in your life. He's the founder of the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute, a clinical professor of medicine at UCSF and the author of seven best-selling books, including his latest with Anne Ornish, Undo It, How Simple Lifestyle Changes Can Reverse Most Chronic Diseases. Dr. Ornish's 40 years of research has proven scientifically and conclusively for the first time that lifestyle changes can prevent and reverse heart disease and prostate cancer can turn on health promoting genes and can reverse aging on a cellular level. The Ornish program was the first lifestyle based program for reversing disease to be covered in the history of Medicare. Life Magazine has recognized Dr. Ornish as one of the 50 most influential members of his generation. Dean, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thanks, Ocean. It's great to be there. I really appreciate the chance to, uh, to be on your show. We're just thrilled to have you here. And, and speaking to every one of our participants, we're so glad you're here as well. I think it's exciting. I think it's powerful. I think it's even revolutionary when we can join forces with peers who are on a healthy eating path and we can learn the latest insights of medical science and we can put them into action in our everyday lives. In this hour, I'm going to be asking Dean some questions that are on a lot of our minds. And I'm also going to share some of the specific questions that have been submitted by our Whole Life Club members in advance of this interview, as well as a few that may be submitted during this interview. When we complete our time with Dean, I'm going to introduce you to Whole Life Club. And if you're not already a member, I want to encourage you to stay on with us so you can learn all about it and what might be in it for you. And if you're so eager, you can't wait, or if you're curious, but no, you're going to have to leave early. There is a button on the broadcast page that lets you learn all about it anytime. And in celebration of the launch of 31 Day Food Revolution, it's on super sale 
for this weekend only. I want to encourage you throughout this event to make use of the comments area at the bottom of the broadcast page. We've got staff here to moderate. And if you hear anything especially inspiring during this action hour, anything you want to remember or highlight or magnify to share with our community, then please go ahead and post it so everyone else can see it as well. So now, jumping in, Dean, we know a lot about the human heart. And worldwide, we're spending almost a trillion dollars every year treating heart disease. And yet, last year, 14 million people died of heart disease on this planet. What are we doing wrong? <laughs> well, first of all, heart disease is preventable and even reversible for the vast majority of people today. It's not like we need to, uh, to discover a new drug or a new laser or something really high tech to treat that. We know how to do that now. And in the 40 years of research that I've been directing, we showed that even simple lifestyle changes, what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much love and support we have, and uh, how much exercise we get, or to reduce it even further to eat well, move more, stress less, love more, boom, that's it. The more diseases we study and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more evidence we have to show how powerful these changes are and how quickly people can get better and often even reverse the progression of these diseases. And as you indicated, we started with heart disease. We found these same lifestyle changes could reduce high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, early stage prostate cancer could be slowed, stopped, and often even reversed. These same lifestyle changes can lengthen telomeres in a study we did with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate how long we live. In a sense, as you say, when the Lancet uh, sent out a press release worldwide when we published that paper, they called it reversing aging at a cellular level. And they, we also found in a study we published with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome, that when you change your lifestyle, it changes your genes, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad ones, over 500 genes in just three months. And we just began the first randomized trial to see if these same lifestyle changes can reverse early stage Alzheimer's disease. Well, so why is it that with all this talk about personalized medicine, that these same lifestyle changes can reverse so many different conditions? And the unifying theory, the kind of the radical theory that I'm putting forth in this, in this new book with uh, my wife, Anne, is that I was trained, like all doctors, to view all of these different chronic diseases being fundamentally different from each other. That heart yeah. disease is different than diabetes, is different than prostate or breast cancer or Alzheimer's. But in reality, they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome, and telomeres, and gene expression, and angiogenesis, and so on. And each one of these mechanisms is directly influenced by eat well, move more, stress less, love more. And so rather than seeing, and it helps explain why many people have more than one of these diseases at the same time. They'll have high blood pressure and be overweight and high cholesterol and heart disease, for example. Or in countries where they tend to 50 or 60 years ago in Asia, where they ate a mostly plant-based diet and they were exercising, had stronger social ties, their risk of heart disease was about as low as it is for malaria is here. But when they start to eat like us and live like us, then all too often they start to die like us and all these genes now get expressed. And so it helps explain from a cultural standpoint why whole populations of people can prevent or even reverse the progression of heart disease if they simply make these lifestyle changes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people know about the Ornish program. It's legendary. It hardly needs any introduction. But I think that a lot of folks do not realize the, uh, the actual facts, the actual data on what you've actually demonstrated. So can you give us a few, a couple of facts, like what level of reversal, what percentage of people can get better from heart disease? What percentage of heart disease can we prevent based on the research you've done by implementing the Ornish program or the, the principles of it? In our study, we, which we published uh, in the Lancet, in the Journal of the AMA, and Circulation, the New England Journal of Medicine, the American Journal of Cardiology, and so on, we found that 82% uh, of people in our study were able to reverse the progression of their disease. Uh, most of them could stop it, it didn't reverse it. But it was a direct function of how much they changed their lifestyle. In fact, in all of our studies, we found, you know, I thought when I began doing this work, Ocean, that the younger people with less severe disease would do better, but it turns out I was wrong. It wasn't how old they were, it wasn't how sick they were. The more they changed their lifestyle, the more they improved, both in how they felt and in every way we can measure. Whether it was hard- Okay, everybody listening right now, whatever age you are, take that in. It's That's not right. about it how is. old you are, it's about how much you do it. 
That's right. At any age, the more you change, the better you get. It's a very empowering message to give people because it's basically saying, hey, it's never too late. In fact, we found in our studies the most reversal was in the oldest patient who was uh, 86 when he entered and you know 92 when he finished. And so it's never too late to begin making these changes. And knowing right. what we now know, if, if everyone actually were to make to follow our program to the degree that we ask them to do it, heart disease, you know, probably 99% of heart disease is preventable and often even reversible today, knowing what we know now. But it's not like there was one set of diet and, um, and lifestyle recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for prostate cancer or diabetes or whatever. It's the same for all of them. And again, because they all share these same underlying mechanisms. And it's not just about reversing and preventing disease. It's about quality of life. It's about feeling better. And if you want, we can talk more about that as well. Totally, and we, we definitely will. Um, you know, and, and actually I, I wanna talk about Undo It for a second because this is an incredible new book. It's just been out for a couple of weeks. It's a um, must read book. Um, Dean, it seems to me that you and Anne wrote Undo It because um, you, know, you are wanting to help everyone implement the principles that you've developed so that you don't have to be, you know, uh, covered by Medicare and on, li on, on in a life-threatening situation to implement these changes. You don't even have to have heart disease because in a sense, you know, if you drive your car into a brick wall, cause of death might be brick wall impalement, but we all know that it's actually bad driving. Right. And similarly, I think that heart disease is a symptom of a lifestyle. And if you don't get heart disease, you're gonna get prostate cancer or breast cancer or, you know, Alzheimer's, you're gonna get something else because the American way of the modern uh, industrialized diet leads to the modern industrialized diseases. And you are, I think, giving us a roadmap out that everyone can apply. Um, so let's, let's touch for a moment on those four core principles. You know, eat well, stress less, more, move more, love more. I think I got it in the wrong order, but That's you know enough. the point. <laughs> um, so let's just touch on that. What does eat, what does eat well mean to you? Well, let me first say, by the reason that we called it undo it is because my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had something like that in our lives? And turns out now we do. Yeah. I begin with a quote by Albert Einstein, one of my favorite quotes, who says, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it well enough. And so what we tried to do was to take the 40 years of work that we've done and condense it to what's really the most essential. And that really comes down to, as you say, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And so eat well means eat a whole foods plant-based diet or to the degree that you can. Now, if you're trying to prevent disease, it's not all or nothing. To the degree that you can move in that direction, there's a corresponding benefit as we talked about. If you're actually trying to reverse disease, the reason we were able to show these for the first time is that most people didn't go far enough. It takes a lot to reverse a, a chronic condition that's life-threatening. It's the uh, pound of cure versus the ounce of prevention. And so to reverse disease, it's basically fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, in their natural, uh, unrefined form, low, naturally low in fat and low in sugar. It's not fat versus carbs, they're both important. And more and more evidence is coming out that, you know, having debated Dr. Atkins, you know, a number of times before he died, and it turns out his autopsy showed he died of, of uh, severe heart disease, heart failure. Um, he was the low carb guy, so I got pegged as the low fat guy. It's never been just about low fat, it's really, it's about whole foods. And it's really more than just the whole fat versus carbs debate, because Part of the research that we, we talk about in the new book they are the number of studies showing that the animal protein itself, particularly from red meat, is really bad for you. The people who eat a lot of animal protein are 75% have a 75% higher risk of premature death from all causes and a 400% increased risk of premature death from, from type 2 diabetes and a 500% increased risk of premature death from prostate, breast, and colon cancer. So these are not trivial differences. And the animal protein triggers all these mechanisms we've been talking about, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and so on. So it's a whole foods plant-based diet that's delicious and nutritious. And as you well know from, from your many uh, um, books and works and lectures, that you don't have to make this choice between is it fun for me or is it good for me or no, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem that way? You know, the, you can eat foods that are delicious and are really good for you and that make you feel good very quickly. One of the studies that I quote in the new book is from a new film that James Cameron and Luis Ayoyo did called Game Changers, where they gave a single meat-based meal to these three elite athletes in their mid-20s, and they measured the frequency and the duration of erections they had at night. It's a natural phenomenon when guys sleep that they have erections. And then they gave them a single 
plant-based meal and did the same thing. And after just one meal, they found that the guys who had the plant-based meal had three to 500% more frequent erections and 10 to 15% harder erections after the plant-based meal than the meat-based meal. I'm told that the film crew became uh, vegan after shooting this scene. And it emphasizes that it's not about just preventing something bad from happening years down the road. It's about these are changes that make you feel better, that make you look better, they improve your sexual function, your brain gets more blood, you think more clearly, you can grow so many new brain neurons, your brain can get measurably bigger, your face gets more blood, you look younger. I mean, I'm 96, I think I look pretty good. Um, <laughs> Your uh, heart gets more blood, your sexual organs get more blood flow, everything works better. So that's the eat well. The move more yeah. is just exercise, you know, aerobic exercise, stretching exercise, and strength training exercise. And the best exercise is the one that you like, because if you like it, you'll do it. And again, it's not like you have to do one kind of exercise for heart disease and a different one for diabetes or whatever. Again, because they share, all share the same mechanisms. And a little goes a long way. So if you can incorporate that into your daily life, you know, buy a portable phone, for example, I find is a really cheap, good investment. Just walking around while you're talking on the phone, you can get out of the chair, which, you know, people say sitting is the new smoking and just walking around makes it easy. You don't, it doesn't take any more time to talk on the phone when you're walking around than it does when you're sitting at a desk. And, you know, I used to get mad when I couldn't find a parking place near the gym, which I thought that's pretty ridiculous, you know, so deliberately parking farther away, taking the stairs, just little things you can do in your life, even if you don't want to block off a, an hour to go to the gym. So eat well, move more, stress less is uh, stretching, breathing, meditation, very simple yoga based exercises that you can incorporate into your daily life. It's not though that, I mean, when you, when you do these techniques on a regular basis, they make your fuse longer. People often say things like, you know, I have a short fuse and I explode easily, but now yeah. my fuse is longer, things don't bother me as much. But beyond yeah. that, they're not just about managing stress, although it really can help you do that or performing better in athletics or in school or in business, it can certainly help you do that as well. And some studies show that meditation alone can actually change your gene expression and hundreds of genes in just a few weeks. But it quiets down our mind and body to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that that's really our natural state. It's not like we have to get that from outside ourselves. That's who we are. And yeah. so much of our culture, mm -hmm. the whole advertising industry teaches us, you know, if only you buy this product or get this thing, then you'll be happy. Then you won't feel stressed and people will love you and everything will be great. And once you set up that view of the world until you get it, you're stressed. If someone else gets it, then you're really stressed. And even if you get it, it's great for a little bit, but then it's never enough. It's soon followed either by now what? It's never enough or so what? It doesn't really provide that lasting sense of meaning. Yeah, so, I think that's really profound. I just want to underline something you just said because it's touching me in a deep way, Dean. Um, I think that health, peace, joy are in a certain sense our natural state of being. They are. That once we are um, outside of all the distress, all the freneticness, all the reactivity, all the agitation, you know, your body has a, a in its DNA imprint, an extraordinary impulse towards, towards wholeness, towards wellness. And, here. and, you know, pathogens come in all the time and your immune system deals with them and you don't even notice it. Cancer cells even pop up and your body clears them out and you never are even knew they happened. Uh, our bodies are extraordinarily resilient and there are so many biological functions taking place right now. You know, synapses firing and cells reproducing and activities forming that are all in exquisite harmony. And, you know, um, that's, that's the essence, I would say, of who we are, what we were made for. And similarly, when we talk about stress, sometimes we think that we are stressed or agitated. We become a source of stress or agitation. But that's a pattern, I think. And I think that there is a deep peace that is available to us when we let go of that, when we drop out of all the agitation that, that we land in. And I just want to invite all of us to take that in for a moment, mm -hmm. that who you are is far more healthy, far more resilient, far more peaceful, and even far more joyous and far more functional than you may have ever imagined. And what we're talking about is when you treat your body right, when you create the right conditions, you get to more and show up with who you natively are, with what well, your nature actually is. That's all true. And uh, I studied uh, meditation and yoga for 40 years with an ecumenical spiritual teacher named Swami Satchidananda. And people would say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo, <laughs> you know, which is part <laughs> of the title of the book is paying homage to that. 
because uh -huh. the idea is that <clears throat> we often think that <clears throat> that these stress management texts bring us a sense of peace and well-being, but rather, as you say, it, that's our natural state is to be peaceful and happy and joyful. Yeah. And that what they do is they help us at least temporarily to stop disturbing what's already there. Now that may sound like, <clears throat> pardon me, like a semantic difference, like, oh, what does that really matter? Well, it makes all the difference in the world because if our peace and our health and our well-being are outside of us and we have to get them, then everyone and everything that has what we think we need has power over us. But if the question is, what am I doing to disturb my own innate and inner sense of peace and joy and health and well-being? That's very empowering, not to blame, but to empower, because I can do something about that. And then the question shifts from how can I get what I think I need to how can I stop disturbing what I already have? And the other thing that happens when you meditate <clears throat> is that your mind quiets down and you get you experience more of an inner sense of peace and well-being. But you also experience a transcendent state that on one level we're separate. You know, you're you, you and I, me, and we can enjoy talking to each other this morning. But on another level, we're part of something larger that connects us all, uh, whatever name you give to that. I mean, even to give it a name is to limit what's essentially an ineffable, you know, transcendent state. But that double vision that on one level we're the, the, the drama on the movie screen, but another we're the light behind that on the projector is kind of the antithesis. It's, it's really where all the essential spiritual truths really come from. Love and compassion and forgiveness and altruism and service really come from that basic understanding that we're really not that different from each other. You know, it's the antithesis of the, you know, the, the other, you know, those Mexican rapists and Muslim terrorists or whatever, whatever it is. You know, that's once you define someone as being fundamentally different from yourself, then you can do bad things to them because they're not you. Once you see them as you in another form, then suddenly it's like, how can we find ways of living together? And as a <clears throat> one study that I love that showed how interconnected we are was from Nicholas Christakis at Harvard. And he found that if your friends are obese, you're 45% more likely to be obese yourself. If it's your friend's friends that are obese, you're 25% more likely. And if it's your friend's friend's friend that's obese, you're 10% more likely to be obese yourself, even if you've never met them. That's how interconnected we are. Wow. So, and so the, the, the stress less is really moved into the fourth component, which is love more. And the love more is love yourself, not as a selfish act, because you know, the heart pumps blood to itself first so that it can then pump blood to the rest of the body. You know, if you're on a plane and they say, if the airbag should come down, I mean, the uh, oxygen mask should come down, put it on yourself first, then put it on your small child because otherwise you'll pass out and nobody's happy. Yeah. So to the degree we can learn to love ourselves and have compassion for our own darkness and weakness and so on, then we can have compassion and love for others and not project our darkness onto them. And so it's really the most selfish as well as the most unselfish thing we can do is to love more. And study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from pretty much everything when compared to those who have that sense of love and connection and community. So it's a really important component of our, of our one of the fourth component and maybe the most important of our whole program. What I think is fascinating about the studies I've seen on love and connection is that you can, you can uh, have connection and love in all kinds of different forms. You know, for some people, maybe it's a personal growth workshop, but for other people, maybe it's a bowling club or a bridge club or a, a church group or, you know, uh, whatever it is that builds bonds between yeah. people and helps us feel a sense of belonging, a sense that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. That's exactly right. And, you know, the reason why that's important is that 50 years ago, 60 years ago, most people had that. They had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a, a job that felt secure where they knew their fellow employees. They had a, a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people that they grew up together. They had a church or synagogue or club, as you say, that they belong to. And many people today don't have any of those things. And we're realizing part of the value of science is to raise awareness about how much these things really matter, that the time we spend with our friends and family and loved ones isn't a you know, the luxury that you do after you've done all the important stuff, that it is the important stuff. There's really nothing <clears throat> that we can do that has a bigger impact on our, on our health and our well-being and in even our, our, our survival. And so that's why we've made this such an important part of our program. But it doesn't even have to be a person. You know, you have a dog. You know, one of the great things about most mm -hmm. dogs, if you come home, they don't ask you how many books you sold or how, you, <laughs> or, you know, how much money you made. It's like they're just happy to see you. You know, that's really an unconditional form of love. So anything that you do in the name of service, of helping other people, really is something that helps heal that isolation. And, and even the word heal comes from the word to make whole. You know, uh, the word uh, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to, uh, to yoke, to unite, to bring together. Anything that brings us together is really healing.
Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump right into some of the questions that have been coming in because there's a lot of them. Um, Camille said, hi, Dr. Ornish and Ocean. Thank you for your amazing work. What is the research on healing from a broken heart? What are the most supportive ways to heal from extreme trauma early in life? And is an early broken heart an indicator for future heart disease? Actually, early trauma is an indication for not only future heart disease, but for pretty much all chronic diseases. And the reason is, is that if you were abused as a child, like sexually or emotionally or physically abused, especially if it was from a parent or a, a sibling, the people are really supposed to protect you. If they violate that trust, <clears throat> it makes it hard to trust anyone because you can only trust someone to the degree that you can open your heart and be emotionally vulnerable to them. And, you, and if you feel like you've been abused when you did that, then the world isn't safe. And so people often overeat to kind of literally create a, a barrier to that. Or they'll say, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes to try to cope with that pain. Or they'll you know, use opioids or other drugs to numb the pain or video games to numb the pain or working all the time to distract themselves from that pain. So part of our work is to, in the support groups that we have, is to create a safe place that enables people to kind of let down those emotional defenses and open up. You know, if you grow, if you grow up in a family with two or three generations of people, they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. You know, all those nice things you said about me at the beginning of the show. You could have said, well, you know, you were, he was also suicidally depressed when he was in college and he messed up here and he messed up there, you know. And if you grow up in a family with two or three generations of people or a, uh, a neighborhood like that, they don't just know your Facebook profile. They know you. They, it's like, I see you, like in that, yeah. uh, the film Avatar. You know, I see you. I see you, all of you. In fact, one study showed that people who uh, spend the more, the more time you spend on Facebook, the more uh, depressed you are because it looks like everybody has this perfect life but you. So one of the ways of healing that trauma, of course, if you can see a good therapist and that you can trust and kind of re-heal some of that, but also is to develop friendships to say, yeah, I might get hurt again, but I'm willing to open my heart and not to everybody, but at least to one or two people. And to the degree that you can rebuild that trust with someone else, then it can really help to heal at a very deep level. And what we've learned is that information is important, but it's not usually enough to motivate most people to change. I mean, if it were, nobody would smoke. It's not like you go, hey, I didn't know smoking was bad for me. Uh, and focusing on the behaviors is not enough. But when we go to these root causes, which is why I'm so glad you asked that question, because that is a root cause of so much suffering, is that sense that it's not really safe to open up, is to say, okay, well, it may be scary to do so, but boy, you know, that's probably the single most important thing I can do in terms of my health and my well-being and my happiness. So yeah, I might get hurt, but it's worth a chance. Let me try doing that. And to the degree you do that and you can feel how good it is to really be intimate with somebody in a true, uh, a true intimate way, then you get into a virtuous cycle where you want to keep doing that more and more. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think that there's something sacred that happens when vulnerability is held with love and wisdom. Exactly. You know, when those come together, when we can take off the mask, it, we can really show something of who we are on the inside, especially the parts that we don't show to the world all the time, and we can be seen with love. That's what builds profound trust and connection between people, I think. That's right. And when you grow up in a family, you know, with two or three generations of people, it's like, you know that they know, and they know that you know that they know where you messed up, and they're still there for you. And there's just something yeah. really primal, as you say. You said that so beautifully about that need for authentic intimacy. And so yeah. in our support groups, for example, that's a part of our program, you know, Medicare, as you mentioned, and other insurance companies are paying it. We're training hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. And a big part of that is the support group. And people often think, oh, that's just to help people stay on the diet or whatever. But it's not. It's really to create a safe environment where people can let down their emotional defenses and connect in a very authentic and deep way and to realize how good that feels so that they can then go back out to their other relationships and try the same thing. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, speaking of which, um, Denise said that she was in a hospital-based Ornish program and it helped a lot. Okay. She loved it. She now lives in Ohio, elsewhere. She still eats the diet, but she's lost her det determination to do yoga daily, although she does meditate regularly. Um, but she really misses the supportive group. Um, and she said, I now need to take meds for hypertension and intermittent ventricular tachycardia. I can see the stresses that have caused this and I'm determined to get back in the groove and heal my heart. There is no Ornish program in Ohio, not even Cleveland Clinic, I guess. So what does one do when there is not an available support group? Thank you so much for being in my life. Yeah, good question. What we've done in recent, well, I guess about, since the last four or five years, my wife, Ann, uh, developed all the whole the digital platform for our program. 
And it, well, we, the, the program is twice a week for four hours at a time for nine weeks. People get an hour of exercise, an hour of meditation and yoga. I mean, who would have thought Medicare would be paying for that? An hour of a support group and an hour of a group meal with a lecture. Now, after they finish their nine weeks, then people generally would just meet on their own and continue the support group. But what we found is that using Zoom, the same video technology that you and I are talking over now, that they can say, okay, let's meet you know, on Thursdays from five to six. We'll all Zoom in together from wherever we are. And so when people move away, like, like her, or when they're traveling, or they just don't want to drive you know, an hour someplace, it actually works even better because they've already bonded with each other. And then they can just you know, zoom in. It's a very easy technology to use to, as we're using now. So I would encourage this person to, to send a note or call the various people who were in their support group and say, hey, why don't we try doing that? And, and uh, you'd be surprised at how meaningful that can be for people. We, we have people who've been doing this now for many, many years and find it's, uh, it's essential not only to helping them stay on the program, but just because it's so powerful in its own right. Yeah, my experience is that, um, you know, in terms of level of intimacy and connection, you know, if phone calls are at a certain level, that Zoom or Skype video up levels it significantly because you can actually look in someone's eyes. You can yeah. see when they're paying attention and when they're not. You can see their facial expressions. There's so much that gets transmitted. It's not the same as being in person, but right. it can help. For those who are living in a relatively isolated eco environment, you can find kindred spirits anywhere. I believe that love travels faster than the speed of light. I believe that you can instantly feel a connection with somebody uh, and that, that, that prayers as well uh, move, uh, transcend space, maybe even time. That's just well, my personal it, belief. No, it's more than a belief. The physicists have found that there are mirror neurons that actually mirror the emotion of the person that you're talking to. And there, to me, even more far out is this concept of quantum entanglement, which is that, you know, uh, and that the one can affect the other even light years away, faster than the speed of light, as you say. So we are already mm -hmm. interconnected in that way. And one of the reasons I like Zoom is that it doesn't require a high tech, you know, it, you just you zoom in and whoever's talking immediately comes a full screen on the on a full face on the screen. And so it's just simple to use. And so I would encourage people to try that. Yeah. And of course, you can also create in-person support networks as well. And those are fabulous where you're sitting together in a living room. And if you can find some other people who are serious about getting healthy and also growing and healing or creating a supportive environment, just a circle of four or five people can, uh, can be profound. That's true. And what we found is that the best way to be connected is by focusing on your feelings. And it's so easy to make fun of that. You'll be, oh, you live in Marin County, you're touchy-feely, and I get really defensive and say, no, no, look at our quantitative arteriograms and our PET scans and all these hard data. And then one day I said, you know, it is a touchy-feely program. That's what makes it work so well, because we are touchy-feely creatures. As we say, we're creatures of community in that way. And so if I say to you, I think you're a jerk, you're going to cringe and either attack back or withdraw, and it's going to not bring us closer together. If I say, I feel angry and upset, even though that's a quote negative feeling, it actually brings us closer together because the first is a thought and the second is a feeling. And by focusing on our feelings, it really connects us in a very deep way. And that ultimately is healing. Yeah. Um, Robin shared that she's been dealing with breast cancer for some time and she's having a hard time feeling into her heart space, the area physically of her heart because of its proximity to her challenged breast. Do you have any suggestions for opening up one's heart space, including if you're dealing with a physical er illness in uh, that area of the body? Hmm. I've never been asked that before. That's an interesting question. One of the powerful things that happens when you meditate is that your mind quiets down, as we talked about earlier, and you experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being, which is really our natural state. Another thing that happens is that you become more, you can have easier access to what I call the still small voice within, our inner teacher, our inner wisdom, our inner guru, our inner whatever, the God within, doesn't matter what you name it. It's that voice that speaks very clearly, but very quietly. It wakes us up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And so I've learned that you can actually have a conversation with that voice. And I've learned to trust that voice. In fact, all of the ideas of all the studies that we've done have really come from that place and then reverse engineered to see if it's true or not. And in every case, it has been. And so I would ask that inner voice, you know, at the end of a meditation, how can I open my heart? You can actually then, how can I have a dialogue with my heart that doesn't feel like if I open my heart, somehow it's opening my body to the breast cancer taking over. And by having that inner voice, you learn to trust that. It's not like if I tell you something, you can say, well, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true. But if it comes from within, you really learn to trust that. 
And it, it can be very specific. You can say, okay, well, how do I do that? And what do I need to be worried about? And how often should I do it? And how long should I do it? And it will really give you that very specific information. And because it's coming from within, you know that you can trust that. So Thank what I've done before, at the end of a meditation, I'll usually say, to that voice within, what am I not paying attention to that I need to, and just listen. It's amazing what comes out. But if you have very specific questions, like how can I open my heart without you know, worried about what's gonna happen with my breast cancer, it will tell you that as well. Mm. Interesting, thank you. We're gonna get uh, shift gears a little bit and get a little more granular, because we've got a lot of questions about specific foods and so forth given that this is Food Revolution Network after all. Um, and uh, both David and Brenda asked really about the same topic, which is omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHT, and fish oil. Uh, I think there was the comment from David that he didn't notice omega-3s discussed in Undo It, wondering if you still recommend fish oil or EPA, DHA supplementation of some kind and what your sort of take is on that at this point. No, I do talk about omega-3s in there. I'm not sure why, it maybe didn't get in the index. He may not, he might have just missed it. He hasn't read the whole thing yet, he said, although he wants to. Okay, well, maybe that's probably why. Um, I, you know, there are some studies that have come out lately questioning whether fish oils are as beneficial as people say. But I do think that they are beneficial. My mentor, when I was at uh, doing my medical training at Harvard and Mass General, Alexander Leaf, had done a lot of the pioneering work on that. And, you know, everything from when you're pregnant and you take the omega-3s. Now, remember the fish oil, the fish get it from the plankton. They don't make the fish or the omega-3s. They get it from eating the plankton, the seaweed in the, in the, in the sea. So if you're vegan, take the plankton-based omega-3s. If not, you can take the, the ones from fish oil. If you take the fish oil, get the kind, you know, because all fish are contaminated with either mercury or dioxin or PCBs or often all three in varying degrees, get the kind, the brands that have had the bad stuff removed. Um, but, and then people say, well, you know, you can, you, the DHA and the EPA, you can only get one of those if you get the vegan-based version, right, as opposed to both if you get the fish-based. The fish convert it, but your body can convert it too, so I'm not as concerned about that. But they have multiple benefits. Um, if you're pregnant or, or lactating, breastfeeding, and you take the omega-3s, it can actually raise your child's IQ. There was a study in the Lancet by seven points or more, which is huge. Uh, it makes your kids calmer and have you know, less sense of hyperactivity. If you have heart disease, it can raise the threshold of of arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats that can create problems. It can lower your triglycerides. Uh, there are some studies that show it may reduce your risk of some of the most common forms of cancer. So I do think that they're worth taking. Great. Um, we heard from Mary Angeline, who said, I'd like to hear if Dr. Ornish has any suggestions for restoring body to natural health after coming off of statin drugs. My doctor pushed them for years because of marginally high cholesterol levels. I believe this whole food plant-based diet will take care of that. So I've stopped them again, weaned off, not cold turkey. But I'm wondering what lasting effects may need to be addressed. So essentially statin drug recovery. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Well, the, first of all, the thing to remember is statins are of proven value if you have heart disease, if that's all you do. But we found in our studies that we could get comparable reductions in LDL cholesterol averaging 40% in the JAMA studies that we published without drugs, but people made big, much bigger changes in diet and lifestyle than what the American Heart Association or other doctors might recommend. Uh, you know, so often doctors say, well, you know, diet, try diet, but it's not gonna work because most people just you know, eat less red meat and more fish and chicken and take the skin off the chicken and four eggs a week and their cholesterol comes down five or 6%. And they say, well, you failed diet, now you have to put on these drugs for the rest of your life. But what we found is that they may have failed that diet, but if you make bigger changes that, as I say, the average reduction was 40%, comparable to what you can get with these drugs, but without the costs and the side effects of these drugs can include muscle problems, kidney problems, I mean, excuse me, liver damage. There's some question about whether it affects cognitive function or not. But clearly, if you can accomplish the same goal through diet and lifestyle, even the drug companies would say that's, that's worth doing. So I would, first of all, if you get off these drugs, make sure that you're replacing it with a diet that can lower your cholesterol. And again, not just the diet, but stress also raises your cholesterol. Stress management lowers it, love lowers it, exercise lowers it, raises the good cholesterol, and so on. So again, it's not just the food itself. There, there, um, I think taking some CoQ10 is good for most people who are on statins because statins tend to deplete that. But beyond that, if you just stop doing those things and you eat a whole foods plant-based diet and make these other lifestyle changes, Whatever damage that was done to your body is likely to get better. The liver often can regenerate once you stop taking these drugs. The muscle problems uh, generally stop. 
Make sure that you don't have any lasting kidney problem from what's called rhabdomyolysis, which can occur if you get the extreme form of side effects when the muscles break down so much they tend to clog up your kidneys. But ask your doctor to run a, a panel just to make sure that your kidney function and your liver function are, are good. And beyond that, your body will heal once you stop doing those things. Thank you. And that's a beautiful closing statement. Your body will heal once you stop doing those things. Yes. Your body that has kind a of, that's kind of the core message, isn't it? That, yes. Yeah. And also when we give it the space and the love and the attention that it needs to be able to truly do its job as right. it was designed to do. Um, we have a question from uh, Julie um, asking, if a person reverses CVD D through uh, diet and lifestyle, should that person continue to consume absolutely no oil and have a strictly non-fat diet or are small amounts of whole foods such as nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives okay as long as blood work is good? And I will say we have multiple questions on the fat topic, so maybe we can address them all at once. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie um, said, I'm confused with regards to the optimal diet when it comes to fats. Um, some people are saying that we need 15 or 20% of calories from healthy fats like nuts and seeds, MCT oil. What's the latest evidence-based recommendation? And um, also um, we heard from Ardith who said, I wanna know Dr. Ornish's viewpoint on fat. There are some who have the theory that we need to have dairy and fat in our diet. Opposing viewpoint says little fat, no dairy. I know the brain needs fat, but I'm confused about what kind of fat and how much. So. Hey, well, that's a lot of questions. So let me see. <laughs> parse through them. Uh, your body does need cholesterol. It's part of your brain function and nerve function. And it's precisely because of that, your body will make all that you need. There's no dietary requirement for cholesterol. Let's start with that. <clears throat> with, with fat, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, the problem is people get too much. Nuts and seeds we've, we've included in small quantities, even in our reversal diet for some time, because there's a germinative quality. You know, seeds and nuts are like life about to burst out of a, into, into forming a plant. And there's we don't really can't measure that in science, but it's, there are so many studies that have shown that in small quantities, nuts and seeds are good for you, that we include them, in, but not in, in large amounts because they are high in fat. And the diet that I recommend is not completely free of oil. That's because we add the omega-3s, whether in the, the fish oil or the plankton-based form, depending on what your preference is. So I think that you know, that's, that's uh, you know, part of it as well. But I do think that you know, there are studies that show, for example, in the original study that David Blankenhorn did showing that cholesterol-lowering drugs could uh, help reverse the progression of heart disease, they found that all forms of fat were directly, include, were directly um, correlated with new lesions developing, new blockages developing in the coronary arteries. And one of the people said, well, what about the Mediterranean diet? Didn't the study show that the Mediterranean diet was better than a, a low-fat diet in what was called the PREDIMED study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which, by the way, was retracted. They had to then republish it. And what they, the, the, the headline was, Mediterranean diet better than low-fat diet. But they compared the Mediterranean diet to a group that reduced its fat from 39% fat to 37% fat, hardly any reduction, and still way too high. They replaced fat with sugar, which is never a good idea. And even then, they didn't really find a difference in heart disease deaths. They only found a disease difference in stroke deaths because the omega-3s help to prevent blood clots from forming, and blood clots account for 90% of strokes. And so there was such a reduction in when they pooled the heart disease data and the stroke data, there was an overall reduction. But if you just looked at the heart disease data separately, there was no difference. And so the point that I really want to make for your, the people who are watching this is that the only diet that's been scientifically proven in randomized trials to actually reverse heart disease is a whole foods, low fat, low sugar, plant-based diet. And to get away from this whole fat versus carbs, you know, is it low fat or low sugar? I mean, I debated Dr. Atkins and, you know, the paleo and keto diets are just Atkins redux. It's the same thing. And you can lose weight on those diets because most Americans eat too many refined carbs and too much, you know, sugar and things like that. But it's what you replace it with that matters. And first of all, you can lose weight in lots of ways that aren't good for you. And I put a diagram in the book of what happens in your arteries on different diets. On a whole foods plant-based diet, they're clean. On a standard American diet, they're partially clogged. On an Atkins, keto, paleo diet, they're severely clogged, even if you lose weight. I mean, you can lose weight on smoking cigarettes or amphetamines or, you know, being depressed or chemotherapy. Yeah. Those yeah. are that aren't good for you. And so what we try to say here is you want to lose weight in a way that actually enhances your health rather than mortgaging it. And so, you know, uh, when you eat a, a diet like this, you're benefiting everything. And again, the more diseases we study, the more evidence we have that the same way of eating, especially when combined with a 
other aspects of the program can prevent and even reverse all these different conditions. And nowhere has it ever been shown. In fact, studies have shown that when you go on a, a, a keto diet, a paleo diet, an Atkins diet, your risk of premature death goes up by, by many fold. Uh, and so, you know, I would love to be able to tell people what they want to hear. It just, it isn't true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, one of the, I think the, the nutrients that the most people are the most deprived of in the modern diet is fiber. Mm -hmm. In fact, less than 5% of the U S population gets the recommended amount of fiber. Um, and that's probably lower than is optimal anyway. Um, yeah. even the recommended amount. And let's be really clear, there is no fiber in any animal products, zero. Right. There right. is no fiber in any bottled oils, zero. There is very little fiber in sugar or in white flour. And where there is fiber is whole plant foods. And yeah. so it's, I think, you know, we could look at, uh, just as you've identified that uh, the same lifestyle choices that are good for fighting heart disease are also good for a whole host of other issues and bring us more joy. I would say similarly that some of the same foods that are good for one reason are good for a lot of other reasons. So vegetables, for example, aren't just high in fiber and low in unhealthy fats, but they're also high in so many phytonutrients, antioxidants, flavonoids, beneficial components that build a healthy life. And when we talk fiber, because that's what I started off here with, I just want to say a lot of people know it keeps you regular, and that's obviously wonderful. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. And one of the things fiber does is it feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Mm -hmm. And the, it's a form of prebiotic. And that fiber is critical to keeping them happy and healthy and abundant so they can do their job producing the neurotransmitters that make your brain happy, digesting your food well, so that you can actually absorb the nutrients that you eat. So yeah. many people are talking about the microbiome right now and people are taking all kinds of fancy supplements, but really just eating good, wholesome, healthy food is the number one thing you can do if you want to help your digestion be in top shape. Yeah. Well, to address that, I mean, we have over a trillion cells that, <clears throat> you know, some of my best friends are germs, as uh, Michael Pollan once said, uh, that exist in a natural state and in a state of dynamic equilibrium. And yeah. as you see, fiber helps the, the good bacteria uh, to, to reside there and they have so many different benefits for us. Fiber also fills you up before you get too many calories, and it slows the rate of absorption from your gut into your blood. So that when you go from whole wheat flour to white flour or from brown rice to white rice, you're turning a good carb into a bad carb, if you will. Uh, because when you, when you eat white rice or sugar or white flour, because you remove the fiber, it gets absorbed very quickly from your gut into your blood. So your, your blood sugar zooms up. Your pancreas senses that. It makes uh, insulin to bring it back down, which is good. But the insulin accelerates the conversion of calories into fat. It causes chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, all these mechanisms we've been talking about. So that's why the Atkins and paleo and keto people say, well, all carbs are bad. They all do that. You should you know, eat bacon and pork rinds and sausage those are because those won't do that, which is a crazy idea, but it tells people what they want to hear. What I would say is, you, yes, those, those, those refined carbs, sugar and white flour and white rice do that but you replace them with good carbs, fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes and soy products in their natural forms are rich in fiber and other thousands of, if not hundreds of thousands of substances that have anti-cancer and anti-aging and anti-heart uh, disease properties. But the fiber slows the absorption so you don't get those rapid swings in blood sugar. You just get a nice constant level that doesn't get high enough to cause these insulin surges, which is why even people who have type two diabetes who go on our diet and lifestyle program, in most cases under their doctor's care, can reduce or often get off of these medications. And for that matter, their blood pressure pills, their diabetes medications, their cholesterol lowering drugs. And they say, you know, when people get put on them, they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? And the doctor usually says, forever. It's like I often show a cartoon of doctors busily mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing. How long do I have to mop up the floor? Like forever. Well, why don't we just turn off the faucet? And when people eat this way and live this way, under their doctor's care, they can reduce and often get off of these medications that they were told they would have to take forever, which really makes you feel like you're, you're getting well instead of being dependent uh, three or four times a day to remind you that you're sick. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, Jumping to a more specific question from Barbara. She said, years ago, I tried to be vegan. I started getting cavities in my teeth. I stopped. I learned about oxalates and that they can take calcium from the system to carry toxins out of the body. When I read up on them, sure enough, I was eating so many foods that are high in them when I tried to be vegan. 
I've met others who had a similar experience. Now I've been mostly vegan for a couple of years and I'm careful to rotate what grains, greens, nuts, etc. I, I eat. So far, no cavities. Have you heard of this before? Any thoughts on oxalates and cavities and plant-based diet? The problem with most people who are vegan who have cavities is that, you know, sugar and Twinkies are vegan. You know, you can eat a vegan diet that's not necessarily a healthy one. And all too often people, you know, eat a lot of refined carbs or even sugar when they go on a plant-based diet. In fact, the microbiome in your mouth gets healthier when you eat a plant-based diet. That's been shown in a number of studies. And the risk of tooth decay is actually, my dad was a dentist, so I had a particular interest in these studies, uh, is actually much lower. And so um, the, I, I, I would certainly not discourage someone from going on a plant-based diet because they're concerned that it might cause cavities. If anything, the opposite is true. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, we had a couple questions about atrial fibrillation. Um, Marcia said, what foods, exercise programs, and other ideas are beneficial for someone who has had AFib in the past to prevent recurrence? I assume eliminating, st eliminating stress is a big key for prevention. And also, why does it seem AFib is increasing among people, especially those I know? Yes. Well, a number of things can cause atrial fibrillation, one of which is, um, you know, your heart not getting enough blood flow. Stress, caffeine, any stimulants, cocaine, amphetamines, anything that is a stimulant, uh, chronic stress especially, can lower the threshold for causing atrial fibrillation. Or put another way, when you reduce caffeinated uh, uh, intake, when you meditate, when you exercise, when you eat a healthful diet, many people find that their risk of going back, back into atrial fibrillation is, is decreased. Now, there are some people that have such bad cases of it, they actually can benefit from what's called an ablation, where they go in there and they actually zap the part of your heart that's doing that if there's a congenital defect in, in many cases that can cause that. But you know, certainly the easiest thing to do tr first is to try this lifestyle program and see if it makes a difference. And if you're going in and out of atrial fibrillation, you'll see yourself whether or not this is helping you. It's also important that if you're having atrial fibrillation that you talk with your doctor about going on a blood thinner because when you go into atrial fibrillation, your heart, your atria are not pumping very well. They can cause stasis of the blood, which can cause a clot, which could cause a stroke if you, if you, in, in the worst circumstances. And so it's important to get the atrial fibrillation under control, or if not, at least to take a blood thinner for it. Thanks. Um, Jacqueline asked for your thoughts on water fasting, intermittent and two to, day, two to four days and longer fasts. Does this practice improve health markers? Are there any downsides, assuming body fat is above 5% and there's no malnutrition? Well, someone who's got 5% body fat doesn't have a lot of fat, so uh, I would be careful about going on extended fasts. What I find is actually much more accomplishable and gentler is to do intermittent fasting by just trying to make breakfast and lunch or big meals, have a smaller dinner, try not to eat past six or seven, then don't eat at all until the next morning. If you get up and have breakfast at seven or eight, then you've got a 12 or 13 hour fast every day. You sleep better because your body's not trying to digest your food when it's really trying to just rest and sleep. And you're gonna feel better when you wake up in the morning. If in addition, every, every once in a while you wanna do a, a water fast, try to limit it to, you know, especially if you have only 5% body fat to you know, one or two or three days at the most. When you go out of the fast, go in in the same way that you came into it. But I think a much more practical approach is just incorporate that into your daily life now, if you go out and have a you know, big meal on a special occasion, it's not a big deal. But on a day-to-day -day basis, to the degree that you can incorporate that by having early dinners, not eating after dinner, and then having a later breakfast, it will be to your advantage. Yeah, I often um, aim to have 12 hours off between you know, dinner time and breakfast where my stomach gets a rest. And I like to go to sleep a little teeny bit hungry because that way my body can focus on sleeping and really let go rather than having to digest a big meal while I'm asleep. That's and I right. think it's, I actually sleep better that way. And also your brain detoxifies when you sleep. And it's one of the reasons why sleep deprivation is linked with Alzheimer's disease. And so in terms of being sharp when you wake up in the morning and continuing that acuity as you go through life, you know, sleep is one of the easiest and best things that you can do. And especially if you can do it on an empty stomach. Uh, Carla said um, that she's been doing the Ornish program for many years. So grateful for the changes in her life. She said, now I've been eating a vegan diet for seven years, cutting out dairy entirely and doing well. Are you still recommending dairy and egg whites? And if so, what's your reason for that? Um, we only recommended dairy and egg whites early on in our research. Um, it was just as a, uh, 
a compromise, if you will. And, and even then it was a cup a day of either non-fat yogurt or, or skim milk uh, and egg whites because most of the cholesterol and saturated fat are in the egg yolk. I think it's better to avoid those if you can. In the later studies that we did on reversing prostate cancer or the study we're doing now on Alzheimer's disease, uh, we're not including those. Uh, you know, you can get plenty of protein in other ways. And so, uh, you know, if again, if you're trying to prevent disease, you know, to the degree that you make some concessions, if you eat one, if you indulge yourself one day, eat healthier the next and so on. If you're trying to actually reverse disease, then I think it's better to avoid those anyway. And as we've talked about in other studies, I mean, in other conversations, you know, what's good for you is good for the planet. By eating a, a plant-based diet, you're freeing up tremendous resources. You know, it takes 10 to 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein than plant-based protein. I was on the board of the San Francisco Food Bank for several years. I was shocked to hear that one out of five kids in the Bay Area, which is an affluent area, goes to bed hungry every night. There's enough food to feed everyone if we did that. And your dad wrote a great book about that many years ago that made that point for the first time, as well as that more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. So the idea that we can actually, what's good for us is good for everyone else, is good for the planet, imbues those choices with meaning. So when we, it's so easy to say like, what can I do as one person about global warming or feeding the hungry? It just seems overwhelming. But when yes. we realize that something as primal as what we eat every day is good for us, but it helps all these other things as well, it imbues those choices with meaning. And part of what we've learned is that if it's meaningful, it's sustainable. And if it's pleasurable, it's sustainable. And we've talked about the pleasurable part, but I wanted to make sure we talked about how these are choices that can really bring meaning into our lives as well. Mm, thank you for that. You know, I, they, they say to put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others, but then we do need to save the freaking plane, you know? Yeah. And the reality yeah. is that I think we can all recognize we're, we're in a bit of a pickle with some of the issues we face in the world. I mean, in the health world, 19% of our GDP in the United States goes to disease treatment at this point. Yeah. We call it health well, 86% of the $3.6 trillion we spent on healthcare last year were for treating chronic diseases that are largely preventable and even reversible by making these simple lifestyle changes. That would free up a huge amount of money to make better care available to more people at lower costs. And again, the only side effects here are good ones. Right. And we've got, you know, in the US, we have Democrats and Republicans arguing and fighting over who's going to pay for this massive, overwhelming uh, medical treatment budget. But we could slash it with the kind of things we're talking about here. And then it's a totally new conversation. That's single right. payer, not single payer, whatever. It's all different if we can cut the costs down by eating right and living right. Well, that's why, you know, it took me 16 years uh, of uh, dialogue with the people at Medicare before they agreed to cover our program. But we had Bill Clinton when he was president and Newt Gingrich when he was Speaker of the House, people who really didn't, didn't really agree on much of anything. 30 members of the House and Senate and so on who all came together across the political spectrum because these are really just profound human issues. It's all about personal responsibility and so on for Republicans is about making better care available to more people, lower cost for Democrats. It really brings people together in a, an increasingly polarized environment. It's really good to be able to find common ground in that way. Yeah. One more detail question, and then we'll kind of move towards completing this hour together. Um, Chris asks, what supplements do you recommend for heart health for men and women? And relatedly, Donna said, thanks for creating Whole Life Club. In addition to consuming a whole plant food diet, what supplements are recommended for women age 65 and beyond? Hmm. Well, I think if you eat really a healthy diet, you don't need a lot of supplements. But I do think that having a good multivitamin without iron, if you're a woman or a, I mean, if you're a postmenopausal woman or a guy, is worth considering. Uh, some magnesium, I think, is good because of its effect on the heart and the brain as well. Uh, some of the omega-3 fatty acids we were talking about, either in the plankton base or the fish oil base, depending on where you're at on that spectrum. Uh, some CoQ10 can, I think, be beneficial, if you're, particularly if you're taking statins or, or things related to that. Uh, and some curcumin or turmeric, I think, has been found to have powerful anti-inflammatory effects, particularly on helping to prevent Alzheimer's. So I think those are uh, good, good choices for most people. Yeah, and I also include methocobalamin form of B12, and vitamin D3 uh, regularly myself. There's actually a supplement made called Complement that combines EPA, DHA from algae sources along with um, B12 and D3 all in one. If you go to foodrevolution.org forward slash complement, you can find out more about it. And that's a great resource. It's a simple spray. Our kids take it every day without any fuss. So do I. And it's, it's a nice way to get all those bases covered at once if they're bases you want to cover.
Um, so Dean, we're nearing the end of this time. In a moment, I'm gonna invite everybody to stay on with us to learn more about Whole Life Club and the special opportunity that's available this weekend only if you wanna jump in and take advantage of it and put all this into action every day in your life. But Dean, before you leave us for this time, I just wanna thank you so much. I think that you know, if there was a history book written uh, based on what's happened to date uh, around the preventive medicine world, you would be the star of it. Oh. Uh, you have produced the singular program that has been most documented to be the most effective in preventing and reversing not only heart disease, but so many of the major ailments of our times. And what I love is that you are bringing the whole person and our whole lives into the picture and you're showing documenting in a really solid, uh, conclusive manner that feelings and touchy feely stuff and spirit and values and who we are as human beings is so much more than just uh, a bunch of actions on the outside. It's you are helping heal the heart from the inside out mm -hmm. and you're showing that that's the best way to have a long, healthy life. Um, okay. So I think in that sense, you are uh, kind of a spiritual healer uh, and a therapy healer as well as a doctor. Well, and okay. I thank you for that. Well, thank you. And let me just say in closing, first, I'm looking forward to reading your new book. I can't wait. Number two, um, our book, Undo It, is available in all the usual places. And three, we're doing this new study to see if we can reverse Alzheimer's disease. So if you're watching this and you live in the greater Bay Area, go to Ornish.com. It's all free. We're still recruiting patients and we'd love to work with you. Wonderful. All right, Dean, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And for everyone else who's with us right now, please stay on because I want to tell you a little bit about Whole Life Club and what it can do for you. If you are finding that you're learning something here that you want to take action on, that you want to put into action in your life, then this is for you. The, the reality is that heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, they don't care a heck of a lot how many events you attend, how many books you read, they do care what you eat and how you live. And what I've seen for so many people is that the big problem isn't knowing what to do, it's actually doing what they know. I mean, if all that was needed was we just know we need to eat less sugar and processed junk and more vegetables, we would not have a heart disease epidemic right now. We would not have an obesity epidemic with two thirds of our population overweight or obese, but most folks are struggling to actually implement. So if you want support, ongoing support to help you implement, then Whole Life Club is for you. This is an ongoing community where we can stand together, support each other, share recipes, share community, share wisdom. Every single week, you get an action of the week video from me with a simple step you can take to put action in, uh, in your life to get results for your health. Every single week, you get another batch of fabulous, amazing, delicious plant-based recipes. You get community and an opportunity to connect with kindred spirits. You get uh, special access to all of our action hours, including the opportunity to submit questions like the ones you've been hearing today from our esteemed panel of health revolutionaries. And you get the transcripts and a follow-up action checklist afterwards to help you implement all that you've learned so you don't have to be scrambling to take notes. You can actually capture the top things and enjoy them at your leisure. And all of this comes uh, with an incredible annual membership opportunity that's available this weekend only. Normally this costs $29 a month, and I think that's amazing value, honestly, for all that you get. Or, um, but, but right now you can join for just $19 a month. And if you join for a year, the regular price is $247. But right now, just this weekend, it's $127. So you can save almost 50% off the regular annual price, even more off the regular monthly price when you join this weekend. And uh, I just wanna say, we have over 3000 members in Whole Life Club so far. We just launched it a few months ago. The response has been so incredible. People are losing weight. They're getting off medications they no longer need. They're feeling a sense of community and camaraderie and connection. They're trying the recipes. They're bringing more joy and fun into the experience. You know, Dean talked today about the value of love, community, and connection. And that's one of the things we're really creating. Whether you live in a bustling community or whether you live in a remote place, the odds are you could use more kindred spirits who can support you on your healthy living path. 
And Whole Life Club creates that for you. It's a space where you can share your questions and your challenges and get answers. It's a space where you can share your victories and your celebrations and be supported and celebrated in the, in the journey. And it's a place where our team can moderate and support you and guide you when you have questions or challenges as well. So this is really our gift to you. It's our resource to serve you and support you. 